Now, my first guest this morning, I didn't know if he'd be able to appear because earlier in the week, we received from him the dread news that his own mother had been kidnapped along with his uncle and his cousin. But they've been freed. And so he's here. And I don't know how free he is to talk about what happened, but it's my duty to ask him. Please welcome Major Adil Raja, the internet sensation, the truth teller, formerly of the Pakistan army. Adil, by the grace of God, your mother is safe and well, at least I hope so. Uh, are you in a position to tell us what happened to her and how she was able to be returned to our family? Yeah, thank you, George, uh, for this uh, elaborate uh, introduction. Actually, you know, uh, well, last Sunday, once we we talked about uh, this uh, illegal abductions uh, and the gross crackdown, hum gross human rights violations and crackdown on women and children, and uh, little I knew that my own mother would become a victim, I found out my mother wasn't really interested in coming out of the country, but uh, she uh, faced an attack. My sister was driving the car, and my mother was... Uh, uh, sitting right beside her, beside two other ladies sitting in the back seats, and they were attacked by four uh, unmarked vehicles. Twelve gunmen came out right in the military garrison, and they they, they used their guns uh, to smash the windows of the car, and they tried to drag them by the hair. My sister, she, she just sped away, and these uh, unmarked vehicles kept on chasing them and kept on hitting the car, uh, but they were uh, fortunate enough to escape that day that was the 16th of may uh, they went to the police the, the police but the police refused to help them knowing that this is a common occurrence these days and knowing that these are the feared intelligence services who are doing it so well, my mother told me to just please uh, stay quiet for their safety's sake but she was shaken to the core and she just so we decided we asked her again to leave the country since uh, we are five brothers and sisters, siblings and uh, all four of us are living outside the country so she she reluctantly agreed and uh, I, I checked uh, that uh, her name was not on the exec control list, uh, not on the blacklist, not on the no-fly list. So we booked a flight uh, for Dubai where my sister's living. But uh, on the fateful morning, uh, that was a couple of days ago when she was supposed to fly off, uh, my uncle, paternal uncle, who's a retired army officer, Colonel himself, he and uh, he, who's a heart patient as well, and who uh, who's a, who's who, who, his, who, whose condition is critical. He requires oxygen cylinder and medication. And his son, my cousin, they went out to drop her to the airport. But as soon as they left their house, my mother was already hiding in their house. She was too scared to live in her own house. As soon as they left, uh, they were kidnapped by four unmarked vehicles. Now I am told, and they were taken away in different different uh, vehicles and uh, later on through my sources I found out that there was a feared ISI internal wing which had kidnapped my mother I, uh, I they expected me to stay quiet but I didn't I didn't I decided to speak up I decided to bring everything to the public notice that that created a huge public pressure I uh, and I, I'm grateful for my member parliament uh, Sarah I'm not going to name her fully because I need to disclose uh, my location as well I, I cannot disclose my location so uh, she helped me out uh, she wrote to the Secretary of State and uh, to open an inquiry into the abduction of my mother there was a huge global support actually uh, by the Pakistani diaspora free um, uh, Adil Raja's mother was the top trending uh, ha hashtag within the military as well, because of uh, my tweet, I said that, listen, today it's my mother, tomorrow she, she could be your, it could be your mother's. So that really created a huge pressure on the, them to leave my mother after 24 hours. The next day they left my cousin as well, but my uncle, uh, the ailing uncle is still under their custody and they believe that he's the one who's uh, trying to mislead me, imagine that, uh, into doing whatsoever I'm doing. But, uh, 
but he hasn't talked to me in the last complete year. Complete year, I haven't talked to him. And now they're asking my mother to publicly denounce me and get it published in the newspapers for his release. And I've told her, go ahead. People are not fools. They, 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 they know what's actually going on. Actually, there is so little voices of dissent left that they are coming up to their extent to do everything within their power to shut them up. And this is this episode speaks for itself. George. It does uh, with great volume. And thank you for sharing it with us. Now, uh, the point you made there, I think the penultimate point that you made, that voices of dissent are now so rare. And that is because there is a state of martial law. I, I used to travel in Pakistan during martial law. So I know what it looks like. One of the things that it looks like is all the newspapers and all the television reports saying exactly the same thing, refusing because they're not allowed to mention exactly the same people, not allowed to show the pictures or mention the name or uh, report the demands or the activities of uh, any given politician group or politicians or campaign. And that is exactly what we've got now in Pakistan. The television stations, which are many, the newspapers, uh, which are many, are now completely under the iron heel of martial law. Why don't they have the guts to officially declare martial law instead of pretending that Shabazz Sharif, the puppet uh, chief minister, of the country, prime minister of the country is actually running the place. Well, George, because they've got no money left in the kitty and they, they're totally dependent on the World Bank and the International Monetary Foundations to help them out. And, uh, you know, what they're doing right now is that previously there was no concept of social media, but now because of social media, they have to show some uh, sort of uh, temporary, maybe normalcy for, for them to do whatsoever they want to do. Uh, they just want the report of all OK, sir. That's what they want. They want the complete country to say that all OK, sir, and salute them just like that. This is the psychology of military failure, which they're trying to implement on the entire nation. And in doing so, they are using a scarecrow tactics. And uh, they've hired the top journalists of the country, inside the country, to become the scarecrows. And they've also hired the top social media content makers and people living inside Pakistan. Not even a single one of them are is, is able to raise independent voice. So what they're doing is that they are playing the part of the scarecrow to make people just scare away, to shut up, not to talk about what's actually going on. They want to create a temporary artificial normalcy. But uh, it would have worked, George, really. It would have worked if the economic situation was any better. But it's getting worse day by day. And what we're foreseeing is that uh, in this month, in this month, they're going to announce a caretaker setup. And that caretaker setup would come from nowhere else but from the World Bank, most probably, because they are supposed to give them the bailout and it'll be a repeat of the Moin Qureshi era uh, for foreigners would uh, foreign Pakistani might be would be but you know he would be parachuted inside Pakistan like Moin Qureshi who was uh, he, who even did not held the ex prime minister Moin Qureshi did not even held the Pakistani nationality so once he landed at the airport only then he was handed over the Pakistani the national identity card and uh, he became the prime minister and he sorted the stuff out and this is what I think uh, this is as by my information, this is what they're planning to do. But uh, normally, the, the caretaker setup is supposed to be there for 90 days, but uh, they are going to prolong it as long as possible to implement their own strategies and to get relief from the international monetary institutions against whatever they want. You know, I told you in my first program that uh, Asim Munir has promised the Americans and in principle has sanctioned the drone strikes uh, on Afghanistan and the Pakistan tribal area, but the ground situation the people in that area their reaction is not allowing allowing them to launch the strategy so the americans are very much you know uh not not happy with the uh, asim munir right now uh and uh, well there, there are different powers uh, so, uh centers of power even here in the uk some some of them are supporting him obviously but uh, not all of them and i this not before long if this uh, if somebody keeps calling out the bluff well it's very difficult 
it would be very difficult for them to show all okay to the global world. That is actually what's going on. And uh, they're trying to create this uh, uh, this artificial normalcy by using the government handle, government verified handles on Twitter. And they're replying to Imran Khan through Punjab police handle, for example. They're replying to the economist. The economist wrote an article. They said the soldiers go home. Imran Khan must be free to contest time the election. And Ministry of Information and broadcast, you know, responded to it in pure military slang. And that is, in fact, the military arm, the ISI's mil uh, media wing and the inter-services public relation using these handles, the government handles, to answer uh, the international and domestic critique on them. George. Yes, the, uh, you know, military officers, with all respect to you, uh, have never been good at governing. They certainly are no good at being journalists, and they are even less good about being social media activists. You can see the khaki a mile away. Uh, you can uh, smell the the blanco on the on the belts of the uh, so-called social media activists who are in fact government uh, functionaries. Um, how is Imran Khan? Where is he? Who's with him? Uh, and Imran Khan is what a... prospect Sorry. do we have? What prospect do we have of seeing him contesting free and fair elections? You see, George, uh, what they're planning is that they're going, they're already working on political engineering process. And uh, as I told you before in your programs, that they will, uh, they will definitely uh, work out a plan in which only a few of the seats would be won by Imran Khan. And they say he's lost his proper popularity, which is an absolute lie. Imran Khan's party leadership, uh, they, the party leaders, they're betraying him, they're abandoning him. And these are the leaders who join, join hands with him on the recommendation of the military itself, you know. So that is where he went wrong. And now he is uh, bringing in new people, new blood. But the encouraging thing is that uh, the public support of Imran Khan is growing by the day. If at all we uh, we we are able to uh, you know uh, we are able to uh, manage a free and fair election in Pakistan, which is a long shot, mind you, and but if the international community somehow mobilizes and uh, they they pressurize the, pa the Pakistan to hold free and fair elections, Imran Khan would be definitely back in power. But if there is absolute free and fair elections, Imran Khan would come with a two third majority, and that is their biggest uh, you know biggest uh, scare. That is why they're using the scare tactics and that is why they're already working on election engineering process right now what is happening in Lahore where Imran Khan is that uh, his old ally turned foe uh, and, and he was his best friend mind you JKT Jangir Khan Tareen he was his best friend he funded him he supported him but uh, on the question of corruption Imran Khan didn't spare him it was a principal decision by Imran Khan and we respect Imran Khan for that uh, Jangir Khan Tareen uh, parted ways with Imran Khan and now um, Jangir, Tareen, uh, Jangir Khan the JKT, JKT, we call him, he is working on behalf of establishment to form this new process of a new party, uh, for no political party, on behalf of establishment, uh, the King's Party, the new party uh, of a comprising of Lotas, what we call it in our local slang. Lotas is uh, some, uh, it's, it's a small, it's a small thing you use to, uh, uh, you use to wash yourself actually, but these guys, they're turncoats in English. So these turn courts are being uh, to, uh, garnered together to form a new political party, but he's failing. Why? Because Mr. Zardari wants uh, the turn courts for himself because he wants his son to become the next prime minister. Now, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, he doesn't want the turn courts, but but just because he's controlling the army chief and he's got something on him, he wants to be the next. He wants to form the next government without any popularity, without any seats. So naturally, he wants the complete election process to be engineered like the army's got the capability to do that I and mean, it doesn't matter people come out and if they vote what they do is that they you know play with the result transmission system so uh, and uh, and at the same time uh, people of pakistan is nowhere to be seen as a priority in this entire election engineering process which is going on over here and uh, it is happening all happening in lahore right now so it's it's a fiasco it's a situation right now and even right now under these circumstances imran Khan is the single most popular leader of the country without any doubt and he's not uh, you know not willing to give up George. no is he safe 
Is he physically is, safe? George, that's a million dollar question because uh, the military, what uh, they've learned a lesson after uh, Bhutto's, after Benazir and after uh, his, uh, her father, uh, they have learned a lesson that if they're going to make a martyr out of Imran Khan, somebody will, you know, use that and cash that. But they have tried to kill him. They have tried to kill him. You know that he's uh, he's got uh, bullets in his leg. Uh, they, they've again tried. They've tried uh, on a couple of occasions for sure to kill him. But uh, in, in case he is harmed and in case he's assassinated, uh, the public reaction would be uh, unprecedented, more than unprecedented, because people in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, they are carrying arms and ammunition and weapons, and they'll pick up arms and ammunition, and there'll be a civil war. No doubt about it, there'll be a civil war in Pakistan if Imran Khan is assassinated. So they're trying to contain him. They're trying to contain him, maybe jail him later on, and maybe disqualify him for fighting the election. But he's not giving up. And uh, well, uh, the, he still has got support of the Pakistani diaspora. That is the big support he's got and Pakistani diaspora for the first time in the U.S. are getting together in the shape of Park Pak and the Pakistani physicians over there. They're, they're getting together you know, here in the U.K. Uh, some of your friends, uh, the Yakubs and everybody else, you know, they're getting together. They're forming human rights lawyer group to take the, to the, take to the, uh, the Pakistani establishment to the task. So there is a global activism by the Pakistani diaspora. So that is really, you know, what's keeping Imran Khan safe for now.